Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a good afternoon. As you heard, this is the Gopher's Manual Style. My name is Chris. And as, uh, as you just said, I am a senior engineer at MongoDB. I work on the MongoDB Go driver, which is the client library you use to connect uh, to MongoDB from Go. I've been writing Go for about six years, five and a half years. You can find me on the internet at Scriptable. And two fun facts about me. The first is I am an avid baker. I have baked every week for the past five years. You can ask my wonderful coworkers about that. And importantly for this talk, I am a writer. So let's just get into what we're going to discuss today. Let's start with an agenda. But you know, I said I'm a writer. I like to write fiction and all sorts of things like that. I'm not really, you know, a meeting organizer, so agenda is really not the right word for this. Let's instead call this our table of contents. Great, so we're going to start off with what this talk is actually about. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things we can borrow from the publishing industry, so I'm going to get into why I'm talking about this and, and what we're going to get into. Also, why I am the person that's giving this talk. Then we're going to talk a little bit about why this is pertinent to Go. And finally, we're just going to jump into the actual ideas that we can borrow from the publishing industry. So to start off, what is this about? In software engineering, we tend to borrow pretty heavily from other industries to get processes and ideas and best practices. This can be seen in the role of a software architect, which is clearly borrowed from architecture. But you can also see this in things like lean and agile software development, which are clearly taken from lean manufacturing and agile manufacturing. So to kind of support this idea that we can borrow things from the publishing industry and software engineering, I'm going to start off at a lower level and make an assertion. And that assertion is that programming is a form of creative writing. Now this is something that's very near and dear to my heart because unlike many of you in this room, I do not have a computer science degree or a computer engineering degree or anything like that. I actually have a creative writing degree. And the thing that attracted me to programming in the early days of my career was actually the similarities I saw between it and the creative writing that I had been doing in school. And to show this, I'm going to give you two concrete examples of how programming and creative writing are similar. The first is that creative writing is actually an extremely structured art. And it's structured in two ways. It's highly structured in the way that you actually produce the writing, and it's also highly structured in the writing itself. So the way it's structured in the way that you create it is that you, know, you don't sit down when you want to write a novel or you want to write a screenplay and just you know, write chapter one at the top of the page and then start typing, and then you write 8,000 words, and then you're done. You have to do a lot of pre-work. You have to create, in screenwriting, these things called treatments, and in fiction, these things called character bios. And this is kind of fleshing out the backstory, where you're coming from, the history. Because you know, when you drop into a story, there's, there's a lot of that, that has happened before. And you have to have all of that knowledge before you can really dive in to what you're actually going to be, uh, to what the story you're actually going to tell. So in that way, we have these documents that are very similar to the software engineering documents we have, right? Scope documents, design documents that we write before we actually start writing code. But the actual writing in creative writing is structured as well. In screenwriting, we have this thing called the eight sequences. And by following this structure, you can actually predict down to the page at any particular minute in a screenplay what is happening and where you are. And this has actually completely ruined my ability to watch movies in America because everything follows this. And you know, I'm like, oh, what's going to happen next? And I look at the time, and I'm like, oh, this thing's going to happen next. And I ruined the movie for myself and my friends. So I just don't watch movies that much anymore. The other example of a highly structured writing is the three-act play. This is something we all know. We know that plays have to have three acts. That's the kind of way that we tell the story. So in that way, you know, the same way that our programming is very structured, we have interfaces, we have types, we have rules we have to follow, writing is just like that. And the other way that programming and creative writing are very similar is that writing is actually a very iterative process. It's not like you write a treatment or a character bio up front and then just kind of leave it there afterward. Sometimes you need to go back and flesh out a new character or create more char or elaborate on character values you've written before to help you continue telling a story. 
So I hope with that I've given you a little bit of a taste of why I see programming and creative writing as very similar things. So as I said, if programming is equivalent to creative writing, then I'm going to assert that the process you use to turn programming into production material, aka software engineering, is relatable to the process that we use to, create, to take creative writing and turn it into production material, aka publishing, right? We take programming, we turn it into software, we take writing, we turn it into books, magazines, what have you. So that's my foundation for why I believe that we can take things from publishing and pull them into software engineering. And publishing is obviously much older than software engineering, so there is a lot that we can learn about how to efficiently uh, create things over time, right? We publish hundreds and thousands of books every year, and most of the people writing those books aren't actual writers. So, why publishing? What is it about publishing that I really do see uh, similarities to in software engineering? So first off, publishing is very varied, a lot like software engineering. So in publishing, right, we have books, we have magazines, we have newspapers, we have cookbooks. And all of these things have very different processes for turning them into uh, for creating them and actually publishing them and getting them into the hands of people. Similarly, we have, you know, there's libraries, there's databases, there's operating systems, there's web services. All of these things are very different and very varied in the way that you go about creating them. The other thing about publishing that I think we can really pull in is the similarity of roles, between the roles necessary to take writing and turn it into a book or into a screenplay, and the roles that you need to take programming and turn it into software that we can push out into the world. All right, so with all that set up, what am I actually gonna be talking about that we can borrow from the publishing industry? Because there's a ton of things we could likely take. The first thing I'm gonna talk about are editors. And this isn't like Word or your typical code editor. What we're talking about is the actual person that sits down and you know, marks up a manuscript and helps carry a book or another piece of publication through the process. And the second thing we're gonna talk about is the namesake of this talk, manuals of style. And I'll define those later. So you might be thinking, okay, great. I believe your premise, and software engineering and publishing are similar, but Chris, this is a Go conference. Like, this isn't general software. Why, why are you talking about this in the context of Go? There's a few points I'm gonna enumerate, and then we're gonna get into that first thing I talked about of roles of an editor. So first, Go is a very opinionated and very idiomatic language, right? We have um, Go Fumped, and that's the format we use. We have specific rules around how we use Go routines and channels and all of these things, and when they're violated, people tend to get like, a bit upset. And writing is very much like that. In writing, we have two different styles, where right? we have like the Chicago style and the AP style, and they are just very different. It is essentially the Vim versus Emacs of the writing world, and it is just as much of a hotbed issue. That said, even with all of those opin opinions and idioms, Go is very flexible. There's still no kind of canonical reference about how we structure a Go code base. Additionally, we don't have any comprehensive manuals of style. There's nothing like the Chicago Manual of Style or the AP Style book. We do have some smaller ones, right? We have things like Effective Go and Code Review Comments, and we have books like the Go programming language, but none of those add up to the size and breadth of the Chicago Manual of Style. And while our industry does have manuals of style like clean code and the art of readable code, those things aren't necessarily apl applicable to Go itself. Next, we have a very good foundation for actually adopting the ideas and the, the opinions that are so strong in publishing because we already have very consistent code bases. As Rob Pike has said, none of us like the way Go format formats our code, but all of us like Go format. And since we're already a community that has accepted that, we're, we are in a prime position to accept other types of opinions and idioms that will help us build more consistent software. And finally, grow, Go is growing and changing at a rapid pace. At this conference, we're talking about things like generics, things like modules, 
And these kind of open up the language to be a more complex thing. And people over time will want to be able to section the language off into just the things that they want to use. So I hope with that, you understand why I'm actually giving this talk at a Go conference. So first up, let's talk about the roles of an editor, the first thing I think we can start borrowing from from the publishing industry. And before I get into it, uh, I'm going to describe the roles that an editor, um, the roles an editor has over the course of a book being published, right? From actually writing a manuscript all the way through having a book that you can put hold in your hands and actually read. So we're going to talk about editors, and then I'm going to talk ac about how we can actually see these roles mapped into software engineering. So the first role that we have in editing is an acquisition editor. This is the person that will actually acquire the manuscript that's going to be published. Sometimes they'll get mailed them from writers. Sometimes they'll actually come up with an idea of their own. Excuse me. And they'll actually go and solicit an, uh, a writer to actually write it. And in industry lingo, an acquisition editor will actually likely do the next three roles of an editor as well. The second thing, the second part of the process is called developmental editing. And this is the part of the uh, book publishing process where we move chapters around and we move things from one chapter into another, maybe get rid of entire chapters, rework our table of contents, that kind of stuff. The really high level structuring of a manuscript. After that, we have line editors, and that is exactly what it sounds like. Someone that goes line by line through manuscript, checks for grammar, style, spelling, but also checks for things like coherency, making sure that your facts are actually correct, making sure that you are consistent, and if you're writing nonfiction, say, you haven't contradicted yourself in the course of your book, or if you're writing fiction that you haven't, you know, that a character didn't learn something in chapter 10 that they've already learned in chapter three. A little bit lower than line editing, we have copy editing. And this is kind of the end of the process for an acquisition editor and likely for an author as well. It's where we do the final typesetting and prepare a book for production. Copy editors will go through and they'll do grammar and style and spelling changes as necessary. But this is really kind of the final view of it, the final proofreading. And then the final type of editor we have is called the production editor. Now, as I said, the first four roles here are usually fulfilled by the same person with copy editing, sometimes outsourced. This production editor role is not fulfilled by that person at all. This is really the end uh, that makes the book get published, right? This is the final typesetting. This is the person that keeps track of production schedules. They ensure that, the, that there's warehouses where the books can be stored so they can get to retailers, all of that type of stuff. So now I have described these roles of an editor through the book publishing process. I'm going to compare them to the roles of a software engineer. So an acquisition editor is a lot like a prototyping engineer, right? The people that go in and they're the first ones to like break new ground, explore a space, create a, you know, add something to a code base. Um, they're really the, the front door for everything. The thing I see, the connection I see between developmental editor and software engineering uh, comes in the software architect role, right? These are people that do a lot of high level structuring of your entire code base and your entire system. You know, they define, okay, system A, system B, system C, these all talk to each other in various different ways. This third role, line editor, you know, the person that goes through line by line in a code base, that one I don't think we actually have an analogy for in software engineering yet. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later on in the talk. And then finally, for, the, for this you know, first string of editor, for the first string of editor to engineer comparisons, we have code reviewers that are very much like copy editors, right? They're the people that are doing the final look over the code, making sure everything fits style, making sure everything's working correctly. Uh, and then they just kind of make, give you the pass to put it into production, right? And you might think that code review is kind of like line editing, but it really is later on in the process. Once you get that thumbs up from a code review, you're like, yeah, ready, I can merge this into production, I can merge this into master. And then finally, our production, engine, our production editor is a lot like an operations engineer. The people that make sure that we have servers provisioned, make sure we know capacity, make sure we have our monitoring system set up, all of that great stuff. So now that I've laid out how I see the roles of an editor fitting into software engineering, 
I'm going to give us a few things that we can borrow in the typical processes that we have from editing to make our processes better. So the first thing we can borrow is for, is for code reviews. Over the course of my career, I have heard time and time again that code reviews should be kept small, super small. 500 lines of code or fewer small, maybe 700 lines if you really need to do it that way. And when I hear this, I've always had this kind of gut reaction of, this sounds very dogmatic to me. And I think that comes from me being a writer because I try to think of it like, I can't really write a book 200, 500 word chunks at a time. That's not how I would ever structure it. It's not like you say, okay, I'm gonna write the first 500 words, edit them, get them through the process, get them done, then move to the next 500 and repeat that process over and over and over again. You probably wouldn't produce that good of a book if you tried doing that. You, you have to obviously sit down and write these 200, 500 word chunks, but you don't have to go through the whole process of completing the editing before you move on to the next thing. And at various points in the process too, you have to do this high level structural view, right? That developmental editor view of saying, I need to make sure that what I just wrote matches with what I have written before. And I think for all the tools that we have, we're in software missing a tool here. We don't really have a lot of tools that help us do these really high level expansive views of our projects and of our code bases. And I think ultimately that the goal here for code reviews um, is that we should really be avoiding dogma. I have a coworker who actually prefers to get what most people would consider gigantic code reviews over small ones. I tried to give him a bunch of small code reviews once, uh, about 10 500 line code reviews, and he said, Chris, don't do this. Can you please just give me one 5,000 line code review? That's how I work. So just remember, people work differently, and they like to adjust to different things, and we need to adjust our processes to incorporate the engineers that we have. The next thing that we can borrow from the publishing industry uh, relates to the way we structure our code bases and the way that we maintain them. I think a lot of the time we look at our code bases and look at the way we commit code as just the kind of final steps, right? Someone writes something, goes in the code base, and we're essentially just proofreading and editing it and saying, does this match what we think it should? Good, push it. And manuscripts, for books require a lot more than just proofreading and copy, copy editing. You need to do higher level structural reviews, as I just said. We need to take an expansive look at our code bases and make sure that everything aligns properly. And when I'm talking about structure here, I'm talking about things from the individual types, functions, methods, and variables that we have in our Go files, to how those Go files are named, to how our packages are structured in our directory and how the dependencies flow up and down the directory hierarchy. And this can be an area for a large amount of contention as well. In the Go driver I work on, we had a, I made a decision last summer to split two packages, uh, to split one package into two things. And now, this summer, I'm realizing that that was a terrible mistake and that we have to actually do a lot more work to get around circular imports. And this is something that was likely fairly predictable, but we didn't take that high level expansive look when we were writing that code to actually be able to incorporate that information and not fall into this mistake. Now I do wanna say that not every time we write code or build a, you know, build a code base or enhance a code base, is it like we're you know, producing an entire new book. So in this way, you know, the, continually deliver, the continual delivery of software isn't gonna match up with book publishing. It might be more similar to, say, a magazine, where you know, you're publishing a lot of small things. Or it might be like the textbook industry, right? Textbooks get a new edition every year. Um, there is some new content, usually, and there's a lot of stuff that's been moved around. And as much as students tend to hate this, there is someone whose job it is to look at the whole book and make sure that it still makes sense at the end of the day, that everything still flows together, that you can still actually learn and acquire information that you're trying to acquire. Now I think there's one area in particular where this shines the most in Go. Uh, and it's an area that over my entire career of Go, I have always been frustrated with, and there is a lot of knowledge out there about how to do this well, but 
unfortunately, nearly every code base I've ever worked on is just really awful when it comes to testing. Um, usually, when a, uh, when a code base gets started, we write tests in one way, and then some new people come on, and there's a new testing philosophy, and we, we change the way that we do tests. But rarely do we go back and fix all those old unit tests, right? You might have written thousands of lines of unit tests. Who has the time when you're trying to ship new features to go back and fix all of those unit tests or fix those integration tests and turn them into table tests? We usually don't, so we just don't. We kind of leave it there and we get this lava layer effect in our testing part of our code base. And at some point when we have to rewrite a feature, we'll go back and we'll tear down all the old tests and we'll put in a whole bunch of new ones. And that'll be, and we'll be like, great, this is better. And sometimes we might get so bad that we just say, we're gonna burn everything to the ground, write an entire new testing framework and move everything over and take all of the time to do that. And I think that's really unfortunate because that's obviously a gigantic waste of time. So I've, ton I've come to think about testing in the same way that I think about a notes or footnotes uh, and bibliography section of a nonfiction book. In a bibliography section, uh, you don't really expect most readers to actually ever look at it. It's not something that a lot of people care about. They're like, oh, there's notes here, great. I just read 400 pages, I'm not gonna read 100 pages of notes in bibliography. However, if you don't include your bibliography, your book isn't as legitimate anymore. It doesn't have that backing that it did. You, people can't go and interrogate your sources and ensure that you know, what you have written is actually what your sources have produced. So I think that if we start thinking about testing and the testing in our code bases, like the bibliography, as the thing that actually gives our code bases legitimacy, we'll be a lot more careful with our unit tests and a lot more careful with the way in which we uh, evolve our testing frameworks. And a good example of this is you know, something from uh, book publishing, right? Like if you decide when you start a book that you're gonna use uh, one method of citation in your bibliography and then you get partway through and you're like, actually I wanna use this other style. You can't just leave all of the stuff that you wrote in the one format there and just start adding the new stuff. Your bibliography will be a mess and people will be like, what's wrong with you? And that's the same thing that's true in, in our Go code bases, right? We don't wanna just leave a giant mess for people to have to wade through and try to understand and add on to later. So in a book, when you change the citation method, you go back and you fix all the old citations. So in our code bases, when we change our testing methodologies or our testing frameworks, we have to go back and fix all the old tests. So, now that I've given you two examples, I want to tell a little bit of a story. So I've been working on Go, on the Go driver at MongoDB for almost two years. And when I started at Mongo, there, were, there was a team that I was on, and my boss wrote Go, and I wrote Go. I had one other, one other engineer that also wrote Go. About seven months into my time at Mongo, we had a reorganization, and I wound up on a team by myself now, so no other Go engineer, and my manager didn't write Go at all. And obviously this is uh, a problem for like actually being able to get the product delivered, but also it's a problem because who's gonna do my code reviews, right? I can't do my code reviews myself, and my manager, who doesn't write Go at all, certainly can't do them. So we got loaned another engineer from another team that would do the code reviews for me, and he'd also sit in and he would do design reviews because he was also an experienced driver engineer. This person's name is Craig. He's the same person that I alluded to earlier that really enjoys those 5,000 line code reviews. In fact, when this reorg happened, my team and I were, uh, were in the middle of a rewrite of the code base, and we had this giant 17,000 line patch that we were reviewing, and I handed it to him and said, I am so sorry. And he came back to me the next day, and in Garrett, there was just tons of comments. And I just looked and I was like, did you go through that whole thing in a, in a day? And he was like, yeah, it was, it was great. I learned so much about Go, it was so fun to read your code. I love it. And subsequently, I have tried to anti-up that and uh, given him larger and larger code reviews, some that have topped over 20,000 lines of code, much to my other teammates' uh, unhappiness. Um, but in addition to this person being uh, a superhuman when it comes to code review, he also made it really clear at every step of the way that 
the driver was my code base and that he was there to help me out and he wasn't there to impose decisions or say, no, you need to do it this way. Even if he vehemently disagreed with the decision I made, he would always respect that decision. He would always say, this is your choice. This is your code base. You need to be the one that has the final say. I think that was very important for me as an engineer on the project, but I think it was also very important for the company overall because we got provided this better driver at the end of the day. I still felt like I was making decisions and he was learning more about Go, so when he went to other code bases, he could share that knowledge and he could improve those other code bases. So you might have been thinking during this whole thing that, you know what, Chris? The analogy of an, a programmer being an editor is a little off, right? Like, isn't a programmer actually more like a writer? Don't they produce manuscripts? Aren't they the people that you know, produce the wealth of code that someone else goes and edits? And this is actually the final part of the, of the editors that I want to borrow from, and that's the actual role of an editor itself. Edit it's true, editors do not write manuscripts. And they're not the people that own a book or a manuscript at the end of the day, but they are vital. As I said, a lot of people that write books aren't professional writers, especially in nonfiction. They're people that are knowledge experts. And yet, we can still produce extremely high quality books that become bestsellers that people love to read. And the reason for that is that we have these editors. We have these people that know that they don't own the manuscript, but know that they are extremely important and necessary to having that manuscript get delivered at the end of the day. And some companies have engineers that fill these roles. As I said in my story, at Mongo, we do have people that fill these roles. Craig is a staff engineer, and part of a staff engineer's role is to go and help out on other code bases and learn and help spread around ideas and knowledge. And it really is size dependent. Not all companies can afford to have a dedicated set of engineers that just go around and help out on other code bases and help improve the quality of code bases while not owning them themselves. But at the end of the day, someone needs to be doing this. You need to have people that will do those high-level structural reviews for you, people that will help you clean up your unit test when you decide to make giant shifts in your unit testing framework, people that will have the knowledge and say, hey, in these other four code bases in our company, we do things this way. Maybe we should do it the same way in this code base. Now, if we're going to have these engineers, these editor engineers, we're gonna to have to also level up our ability for them to acquire knowledge and for them to actually impart it on other people. And this brings us to manuals of style. So a manual of style, when it comes to publishing, is generally a, a reference manual. Um, there are many, many, many of them, but there are two really big, well-known ones, and those are the Chicago Manual of Style and the AP Style Book. And as I said, in software engineering we do, and in Go engineering, we do have analogous manuals. We have code review comments. We have Effective Go. But if you look at the size of the Chicago manual style and compare it to Effective Go and code review comments combined, you will see a very large difference. They are that big versus that big, right? It's, it's incomparable. Um, but some projects and some companies do have their own manuals of style, right? Google has their own C++ manual of style, um, and lots of projects have tried putting together their own versions of things like the Chicago manual style and the AP style book. So I just spewed a whole bunch of words about manuals of style, and I didn't really explain what a manual of style is. So let's dig into that for a little bit. So as I said, a manual style is mostly a reference manual. You don't learn how to write, you don't learn English from a manual style. That's not its goal, it's not its purpose. So it expects you to have an understanding of the language already. It's for people that are already writing and trained in the language to use. I think the most important thing about a manual of style is that they are extremely prescriptive. The purpose of the book is to give you a definitive answer to questions that are likely very ambiguous. A very good example of this is um, when you have a quote in a block of text and the quote ends the sentence. Do you put the period or question mark or exclamation point inside the quote or outside the quote? 
that is another Vim versus Emacs level of disagreement. Um, but the manuals of style tell you which to do. And I'm pretty sure that Chicago and AP actually disagree on this fundamentally. The other thing that manuals of style do for you is they provide a, a high level of consistency. By being so prescriptive, by giving you answers, they make it so you can say, this thing right here needs to look like this, not what it looks like now. They ensure that you don't put the period inside of the quotes for half your book and then put it outside the quotes for the other half. And as far as manuals of style go, there's a hierarchy of them as well. There are the mass published ones like the Chicago Manual Style and the AP Style Book. But there are also, for each publishing house, each of them have their own manual of style. And for books that are parts of series or, say, textbooks or things like that, they also might have their own more localized manual of style. So, if we want to write a manual of style, if I'm saying that we should adopt these in software engineering, what's the, the high level of what should go into one of these? And I'm going to assert that the things that should go into a manual style are meta, not design. And these things are often closely related and difficult to dis disentangle. So when I say meta, I mean things like your package structure, your testing layouts and the style of test. Do you table test? Do you do some other style of test? Your commenting format, your variable naming, your type naming, how many methods you allow on an interface, how many go routines do you use? Do you use else statements in your code base? Those types of things. The things that shouldn't be in this are things like wired protocols or storage formats, things you'd sit down and write a design doc for and uh, you know, publish somewhere. This isn't a hard and fast line. As I said, this is all about avoiding dogma. And a good example of a time when you might want to include something that is closer to design than meta is if you have, say, a set of web services and you want to say, when you, all the endpoints of your web services must use this specific authentication and authorization middleware. That's a great thing to go in a manual style. It's something you absolutely want to be consistent across your code bases. So when you get kind of toward the middle, it gets really fuzzy. So how do we get started? So the first thing we can do is we can start with a community manual style. I really like code review comments, and I think that's a really great place to start. I often leave many comments for people on my team and say, hey, look at this in code review comments, or look at this other thing in code review comments. The other thing that you should absolutely not do is sit down and try to write a manual style all at once. These are not revolutionary documents. These are evolutionary documents. The Chicago Manual of Style, that 1,000-page manual of style I referenced earlier, started as a small collection of style sheets that came out of the book publishing process at the University of Chicago Press. And to provide a little context here, a style sheet is something that is produced during the copy editing process of a book. And it either A, documents the styles of that book slash manuscript, or they document how you've deviated from the prescribed manual of style. So the University of Chicago Press took all of these documents, bound them together in a book, and published it. And the first one was only about 100 to 200 pages long. And over 17 editions, it has grown to 1,000 pages. So this is a very evolutionary process that happens slowly over time. And the main way you can know what you should put and when you should put something in your manual of style is when you're asking questions about your code base. When you say things like, why is this thing like this? Or why have we done this in this way? Especially things that don't really have a consensus anywhere and that are very opinionated and malleable. Whenever you ask questions like that, you should put them in your manual style. And eventually, if we as a community start building out code review comments and create larger and larger manuals of style there, and then companies build out their own manual of style and projects build out their own manuals of style, you want to have a way of kind of reconciling all of that without repeating. So we can build tools like Godoc that help merge all of these manual styles together and kind of cascade the styles down so you know in an individual code base which styles you should be using and which things you should be changing. 
And as I've said all along, this is really about not being dogmatic. So even people that religiously follow Chicago Manual style, sometimes, in particular writing, will deviate. And they may deviate heavily. And that's OK, because there's an adage, learn the rules and then break them. And this applies to writers very heavily. So the thing you have to do is first learn the actual rules. You can't just break rules because you feel like it. You can't just put the period outside of the quotes because I feel like it today and it's a Tuesday or whatever. You have to understand the difference between putting the period outside and inside, the context of what you're publishing, and the context of the, the greater ecosystem within, you ex within which you exist. Second, you can't just break the rules because you feel like it and then not document it. So if you do have a manual style, and then you do decide, in this case, I want to deviate from that manual, you need to actually track that deviation. You need to write it down. You need to produce a version of a style sheet that says, this is how we have de deviated. And more importantly, this is why we deviated. A lot of these decisions that you'll put into a manual style will be things that you can revisit in a month or a day, or a month or a year, or two years, or five years. And you can be like, oh, I don't know why I did it this way. Obviously, we should have done it in this completely other way. So writing down the why behind it is very important. And a lot of manuals of style, like the Chicago manual style, have these long articles in them describing things that might seem mundane to regular people, like should you use numerals or should you spell out words when you're uh, you know, saying a number like 45? And most importantly, you need to stay consistent. That's the reason you are writing these manuals of style and why you're using them. If you continue to deviate every time from your manual of style, you'll lose the very thing you're trying to get from that manual of style. You have to ensure that when you do those deviations, they're done purposefully, and that when you do them, you go back and you change everything else it affects. Once again, you can't change your citation format halfway through your bibliography and then not go back and update it. So, in conclusion, Today I've talked about why Go is in a really good position to borrow ideas from the publishing industry. From our already great foundation of using Go format very heavily to have highly structured and consistent code bases, to our growing uh, language features. We've also talked about the roles of an editor, from an acquisition editor all the way into a production editor, and their analogies, and their analogous roles in software engineering, from a prototyping engineer to an operations engineer. We've also talked about how, you can, how we can borrow things from the editing process to make our code reviews and our code bases more well-structured, more powerful, and more consistent. We've also talked about how we can borrow the roles of an editor and the, the vibe of an editor of embracing not necessarily needing to own a code base to, have a high, to own something to have a high impact on that thing. And finally, we talked about manuals of style. These books that we can use, that we can provide to these editing engineers as they go throughout our code bases and throughout our companies to enforce styles and to help us grow and learn how to keep and maintain consistent code bases. Thank you very much for attending.